My name is Tarek Sayer, and you're listening to The Science of Philosophy. Today, Nietzsche, Part 1, God is Dead. Before I get into the main part of the podcast, I just want to give a quick overview summary of the main points in case you only have a couple of minutes. So the main points I want to make about this claim that is probably Nietzsche's most famous, that quote, God is dead, is that there are a couple ways to interpret it. Some people interpret it as him saying no one believes in God anymore and in the future everyone will be atheists. Uh, but that's not right. He, in, in any of the quotes which you'll read in this podcast, you'll see that he thought it was something that people quite hadn't woken up to yet, um, that that, that God is dead. So it couldn't have been that they just didn't believe in God, because he claims in the speeches that um, they haven't even realized what they did. So it's something deeper. Then there's this second level of people like Jordan Peterson, who seem to emphasize this point that Nietzsche thinks God is dead is a horrible, horrible catastrophe and that we have to find some way of going back because if he is dead, then our society, which depends on these beliefs in some fundamental way, is going to collapse. And that's also not right because they're getting a part of it right where Nietzsche did think that the death of God was a sickness, an illness, uh, which sounds like a bad thing, but he had this quote where he says it's an illness like pregnancy is an illness. He didn't think it was just going to lead to the downfall of Western civilization and all of that. He thought that it had a great potential to waken us up to things that Christian morality and religion had been holding us back from. Um, And then there's this third level, which is also wrong, where you have kind of supercilious atheists who think that if we can just get people to stop believing in God and to kill God, then everyone will become rational and smart and the world will um, become beautiful and perfect in a utopia. And that's also not what Nietzsche thought. He thought that the pregnant um, possibility where we waken up to things that were holding us back is one of many bad ones. So we have to be very cautious about this. And so that's where uh, I guess I want to distinguish in terms of interpretation of what that means. And then the main points in terms of the truth of his claim, however you interpret it, are that surprisingly people still do believe in God. About 90% of Americans say they believe in God. Um, and that seems to be lowering at about, I don't know, a percent every decade. But that's not as drastic as Nietzsche's quotes seem to imply, but on another more important level, the practical belief in religion does seem to be declining drastically. So the amount of people who, when making an important life decision, rely on God or prayer or religious authorities is extremely low. Most people in America, at least, rely on their own research and reasoning, which some would say does exactly vindicate exactly what Nietzsche was saying. So that's the the main point of the highlight before I get into it. But but as, you know, the introduction to a novel I once read said, the life of a novel isn't in its summary, but in its execution. And this next part isn't a novel. It's a philosophical exploration, but it has some more artistic uh, components to it than just this five minute summary has. So if you're into that kind of thing, continue to listen on. Otherwise, have a great day. What do you worship? What gives that purpose, that energy to your life? I asked Liam by the rocks we were about to jump into the water. He had long blonde hair and a very relaxed demeanor. He hesitated for half a second and then smiled. Weed, he said with a laugh. Later I asked his friend Austin, who was less certain. I said it could be anything, weed, money, love, and when I said love his eyes lit up. He described to me the new girl he was talking to and that rush of excitement he felt every morning waking up. As Austin described this all to me, he started to frown. He told me he just didn't think he was ready to settle down, as great as this new girl seemed, and he felt bad for kind of leading her on, but he really enjoyed the excitement of that talking stage. 
later someone else distinguished between different kinds of love, the romantic love or the love for oneself or one's friends or the world around them. What do you worship? What gives that purpose, that drive to your life? In his famous This Is Water commencement speech at Kenyon College, David Foster Wallace said the following, quote, here's something else that's weird but true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or the Wicked Mother Goddess or the Four Noble Truths, or some inviolable set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you'll always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you'll die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. The whole trick is keeping the truth up front in daily consciousness. What do you worship? What gives that purpose, that meaning to your life? I had a friend once who had just been through a breakup with his girlfriend of two years. He was telling me that once she sent that last message saying she didn't want to speak to him again, that was really and truly over, that internally he had this conviction that this really was the last time he would ever speak to her in a meaningful way as like a person important to her life. He told me that it felt like one of those movies where an astronaut is doing a spacewalk and disaster strikes, there's some sort of explosion and you become disconnected from your ship and are sent hurtling into empty space as your ship careens into a tiny speck in the distance. And eventually there's that moment where the ship disappears and they're truly and utterly alone in the deep darkness of nothingness and nobody is coming to save you, separated from anything of value, importance, or meaning. Just try to put yourself in his shoes. Imagine the terror you would feel as you looked around and lost all sense of direction, all sense of orientation, up or down, would you not eventually get bored floating through that dark sea of nothingness? Would not eventually the banality of the boredom become itself banal? Would not non-existence eventually seem desirable? If you can imagine the terror of this situation, you can get the tiniest speck of understanding for just how terrified Frederick Nietzsche was at the end of the 19th century. Because for Nietzsche, the surrender into the emptiness of nihilism wasn't just happening to one of his friends, he saw it happening all around him. He envisioned entire societies falling into the emptiness my friend briefly experienced. And he seemed to connect it to this infamous phrase of his that God is dead. And I have to warn you, it's, it's not immediately obvious that the society we live in today isn't exactly the nightmare he worried about. There's this interesting fact in astronomy that the universe is expanding at an ever-increasing rate, which means eventually the rate of expansion will surpass the speed of light, and all the light from the other galaxies and even nearby stars will no longer be able to reach us here on Earth. Future humans might read in ancient books about the seas of stars and galaxies their ancestors used to gaze up to, but they could be forgiven for being incredulous. There's a point of no return where, after a certain point, what was once obvious to everyone is discernible to no one. Let's hope we haven't reached that point yet with regards to Nietzsche's worries. But in the spirit of that future astronomer, witnessing day by day more and more stars flicker out of visibility and urgently trying to record their existence for posterity, let's examine and evaluate Nietzsche's philosophy, starting with his famous declaration that God is dead. The Madman by Frederick Nietzsche The Madman have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I see God, I see God. 
As many of those who do not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Why did he get lost, said one? Did he lose his weight like a child, said another? Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage or emigrated? Thus they yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his glances. Whither is God, he cried. I shall tell you, we have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how have we done this? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What did we do when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving now? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually, backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? Is there any up or down left? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night and more night coming on all the while? Must not lanterns be lit in the morning? Do we not hear anything yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we not smell anything yet of God's decomposition? God's too decompose. God is dead. God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we, the murderers of all murderers, comfort ourselves? What was holiest and most powerful of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred game shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must not we ourselves become gods simply to seem worthy of it? There has never been a greater deed, and whoever will be born after us, for the sake of this deed, he will be part of a higher history than all history hitherto. Here the madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners, and they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw his lantern on the ground, and it broke and went out. I come too early, he said then. My time has not yet come. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of man. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars requires time. Deeds require time, even after they are done before they can be seen and heard. This deed is still more distant from them than the most distant stars, and yet they have done it themselves. According to Nietzsche, one of the superstitions which seems to have been tossed out alongside magic, alchemy, and astrology is a genuine belief and fear of God. But his super dramatic slogan that God is dead is not simply an assertion of atheism. Nietzsche isn't so much concerned with the metaphysical existence of God as he is concerned with the belief in God as a cultural phenomenon. What do I mean by this? Well, with Nietzsche, it's important to distinguish between belief that God exists and the belief in God, which doesn't really sound like it makes sense, but let me try to explain. For Nietzsche, to be a Christian is not simply to make the sounds, I believe in God, with your mouth when someone asks, to go around sinning all week just to go to church on Sunday and sing the popular hymns. Um, for him, and, and Kierkegaard and others to some extent, true belief is to like really feel oneself in the presence of and fear of God. There were medieval missionaries, you know, there's this film Silence by Martin Scorsese, where he explores this, these, these medieval missionaries who were willing to be crucified, to, they were willing to watch their closest friends and family be crucified, they're willing to be hung upside down for days without food or water, all before they would merely step on a picture of Mother Mary, not even Jesus. And for them, the belief in God it had real power. You know what I mean? It wasn't just an accessory to their personality. It was the driving force behind their life, their purpose, their meaning. It had practical significance in their lives. 
It's what they worship, not just in their prayers, but in their everyday actions. What do you worship in your everyday actions? So all of this is just to say that Nietzsche's concern with God has nothing to do with metaphysics, or the actual existence of a supreme being. It's a sociological interest. To quote one of my favorite existentialist scholars, Robert C. Solomon, in his book From Rationalism to Existentialism, he writes the following, quote, Nietzsche does not begin his philosophy with an assertion of atheism or with a demand for purely naturalistic values. He begins with the empirical claim that the supernatural sanctions of Christianity are no longer effective in European culture. God need not be non-existent. He simply does not matter. Did you catch that? Nietzsche is making an empirical, sociological, and therefore scientific claim about people's belief in God, something which can be and has been scientifically measured. So let's measure it. Let's see what the scientific findings find. Inshallah, inshallah, la 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 Inshallah, John is one of the nine in ten Americans who still believes in God or a universal spirit, according to the Pew Research Center. If you ask John why he believes in God, he'd appeal to the most obvious answer, which is this. Look around you, dummy. The bird eats some seeds and somehow patches a perfectly smooth egg, which itself hatches a moving, feeling, hungry baby bird. I make some sounds with my throat, and you know what's going on in my head? I go to church and I feel goosebumps and a real transcendental freedom from my earthly concerns which are replaced with a warm, expansive love for everyone and everything that exists. What else do you call that but God, motherfucker? John might say. John's friend Avery is one of the one in ten Americans who doesn't believe in God or a universal spirit, according to the Pew Research Center. Him and John get into this sometimes, and he always brings up what John likes to call evil-lution. Quote, in 1859, when Charles Darwin published The Origin of Species, Avery tells him, pretty much overnight the arguments for the existence of God you're expressing based on the complexity of life or religious experience evaporated because from that point on, the chicken and the egg, the goosebumps on your arms and the serotonin in your brain, it's all totally and persuasively explained by the natural machinations of a lifeless universe now. We don't need divine intervention anymore to explain it. But don't you see how it's not a lifeless universe? Because we're in it, and we're part of it all, John. And if you need some universal authority to validate your experience of transcendental love, if you need something greater than yourself to tell you that it's valid to feel that way, well, you are the universe experiencing itself, John. You have that power. You're like a demigod in Greek mythology who doesn't know his father is Zeus. You can throw lightning bolts, and yet here you are, waiting for a drop of rain. Unfortunately, John is also one of the six in ten Americans, according to the Pew Research Center, who don't accept Darwinian evolution through natural selection, and so Ivory's arguments are never really persuasive for him. But John has bigger fish to fry anyways, because he, a married man, has been unable to resist making romantic advances toward his secretary at work, and the advances have been successful. He's meeting her at a hotel tonight, and although many thoughts race through his brain, never once does the thought occur to him that he should pray to God for advice. You see, he's one of the 8 in 10 Americans, according to the Pew Research Center, who said that they rely on their own research when making a major life decision, rather than prayer or pers personal religious reflection. That's just who John is. He goes through the motions, he attends church every Sunday, he tries to bring Avery towards the light. If a Pew researcher were to ask him how important religion is to his life, he'd be one of the eight in 10 Americans who say that it is important, but the fear of God never truly enters his body in the course of day-to-day -day life. He'd step on a picture of Jesus in a second if it meant avoiding the slightest discomfort. He makes the sounds with his mouth that he loves her to his wife and heads to the hotel. 
مسافة البعد إن شاء الله إن شاء الله لا 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 Thank you so much for your time today. I've been Tariq Zayer for the Science of Philosophy. Next time we'll be talking about Nietzsche on how to find happiness in a world where God is dead. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, first, I want to ask you, what is what is the point of philosophy? It's not, there's not a point. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because it's just thinking. <laughs>